Καλησπέρα. Ευχαριστούμε που ήρθατε. Είμαι η Γαλήνη Νότη, είμαι βοηθό επιμελήτρια των Οργανισμών Νέων και ήθελα να σα καλωσορίσω στην έκθεση Dream On. Την έκθεση επιμελείται ο ιστορικό τέχνη και σύμβουλο τη συλλογή Δημήτρη Δασκαλόπουλου, κ. Δημήτρη Παλαιοκρασά. Η έκθεση παρουσιάζει 18 εγκαταστάσει μεγάλη κλίμακα από Έλληνε και διεθνεί καλλιτέχνε, καθώ και μία νέα ανάθεση και 20 σχέδια τα οποία σχετίζονται με τι εγκαταστάσει. Η έκθεση πραγματοποιείται σε συνέχεια της ανακοίνωσης της δωρεάς της συλλογής Δημήτρη Δασκαλόπουλου και παρουσιάζει κάποια από τα πιο σημαντικά έργα της συλλογής, τα οποία στη συνέχεια θα δωρηθούν σε τέσσερα μουσεία, σε τρεις χώρες, σε δύο υπήρους. Στο Έμστ, στην Τέιτ και από κοινού στο Γκουνιενχάιμ στη Νέα Υόρκη και στο MCA στο Σικάγο. Είναι μεγάλη μας χαρά και τιμή που έχουμε σήμερα μαζί μας τον Τόμας Χίρσχορν, τον τον δημιουργό του έργου Caveman Man, ο οποίος θα μας μιλήσει για το έργο του. Ε, μετά από μια σύντομη εισαγωγή από τον επιμελητή, θα ακολουθήσει η ομιλία του καλλιτέχνη και στη συνέχεια ερωτήσεις και συζήτηση με τον επιμελητή και το κοινό. Ευχαριστούμε πολύ. Μπορείς το χρειάζομαι. Α, όχι. Uh, welcome to our Thomas Hirschhorn talk on Caveman Man, and thank you very much for your attendance. Uh, and a big, big thank you to Thomas Hirschhorn for getting on a plane from Switzerland. Uh, I'll uh, say a few things about uh, Thomas's uh, biography, who I assure you is uh, a very uh, significant artist practicing in the last uh, four decades. Um, Thomas Hirschhorn was born in 1957 in Bern, Switzerland. Uh, after studying at the Kunstgewerbeschule Zurich, he moved to Paris in 1983, where he since lives and works. His work has been presented uh, in many international uh, exhibitions, such as uh, Sculpture Project Munster, Venice Biennial, 1999 and 2015, and also represented Switzerland in 2011, Documenta, Sao Paulo Biennial, Carnegie International, uh, with other venues also hosting solo exhibitions, uh, such as the Art Institute of Chicago, Museum Ludwig Cologne, Bonifantin Museum Maastricht, Institute of Contemporary Art Boston, uh, South London Gallery, um, Thomas Hirschhorn has received numerous important prizes, and his works are in the collection the collections of uh, some great museums, such as the Art Institute of Chicago, uh, Inhotim in Brazil, uh, K21 in Düsseldorf, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the Pompidou in Paris, the Stedelijk in Amsterdam, Tate Modern, and the Walker Art Center. Um, before turning over the uh, microphone to Thomas. I would like to tell a little story about uh, Caveman Man. Uh, I do these uh, guided uh, curator tours every Wednesday. And when I get to the cave, uh, I tell people that I refuse to explain anything about the cave and that they should just go in there and allow themselves to be overwhelmed uh, by what comes to their senses. Um, over these Wednesdays that I do the tours, I will, the, the, the group will go in the cave and uh, I'll sit outside on the bench and then I'll wait for them to start coming out. At that point, I watch their faces and it is incredible, these expressions of awe, of uh, astonishment, of shock. Um, after doing that for a couple of Wednesdays, I decided to share it with the public. And when the first group would go in, 
I would tell the, 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 the other group that sit here and look at their faces when they come out. And that's what they did. And of course, they, 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 they would see these people coming out of the cave uh, and people would, there would be jaws dropping or eyes like that. The, the, these expressions of total wonder. At that point, I, I figured that not only was that the best part of the tour for me, but that of all the words I had to say during the curatorial tour, this was the best thing I could offer my audience. Uh, them witnessing the power of great art to impact people's emotions. And now I think you have some bigger stories to tell about uh, Caveman Man. Calispero. Thank you for your introduction, Dimitris. I am not sure uh, will it be more uh, uh, complex than you explained it just now. So what I want to do today is uh, to show you some pictures and to clarify, after five uh, thematics, space, material, the logic, uh, recurrent elements and specific elements, my work. Cave Man Man uh, was made in 2002 and it was, or it is, my response to 9-11. It is my response to um, the question who arised to me, um, the question like, why I think what I think? Why I do what I do myself art? Why I give the form I give? why art is important at this moment. So, I decided to go into the cave, into my cave. And that's the starting point of Caveman Man. So, I thought I need, after what happened, I need to reinvent the world. I need to reinvent the future. I have to rethink things. Therefore, the starting point was this terror attack and my, uh, the idea to go into the cave and to rediscover the world. They were here was the sentence who Mrs. Brunel, one of the inventor or discoverer of the cave Chauvet in France said when she the first time saw these drawings, these palm, palm drawings on the wall, she said, they were here. They were here. I think this is so a touching moment. She didn't say, oh, they are drawings. She said, they were here. And um, it's in a way what I try to do with Caveman Man, that if you are in the cave, you feel s s they were somebody there. The palm fingers, the fingerprints, I think they are so a beautiful gesture, a so universal and uh, time, uh, no time limited gesture. Uh, because you must know, these, hand, these paintings on the wall, they're 36,000 year old, and still they're finger palms. By the way, uh, I am so astonished um, by the creativity and the simplicity of the negative or the positive a palm uh, uh, drawings on this wall. 
Here are the group of the speleologists, Mr. Chauvet, Mr. Hilaire, and Mrs. Mrs. Brunel, who said they were here in front of this so beautiful uh, paintings. Of course, it is an inspiring. It was an inspiring for caveman man. Always, people uh, used cave to live inside, uh, to uh, take shelter inside caves. Therefore, the thematic of caves came. But also, at this time, perhaps some of you remember, there were these might of the Tora Bora caves um, in Afghanistan. And of course, um, uh, these sources, these pictures, were for me a motor to do my work, a caveman man. But also, as a Swiss, uh, we have this tendency to do tunnels all over. In Switzerland, we have this, we have this, uh, uh, this tendency to do tunnels, to tunneling. Because, of course, we have a lot of mountains, but also there is this tendency to do tunneling. So this was also a kind of idea why caveman man. And uh, at the same time, uh, some weeks before my exhibition, as a chance, I saw this uh, um, newspaper cover, uh, New York Post, the caveman of Manhattan, a real person who lived in a cave up Man Manhattan. So this, by the way, after gave for me the title of the exhibition, Caveman Man. Because it's not about a caveman, it's about a caveman man. And the, this was the, the, the invitation card um, with this cover of the newspaper and with me in the Lasco cave, in the second Lasco cave, not in the real one, Lasco cave, because there is one you can not go in, the real original one, but the one you can go in, the second one, and I went there in order to make my field work for the work Caveman Man. So the space, the question of space is very important to me in, in this work Caveman Man. This is the first drawing. The people who I showed you before, the three speleologues, they did in memory to make it clear uh, for them uh, how, how, how the space they did discover it is organized. Why I show it? I show it because, you know, the cave is a non-architectonical space. It's not a building. It's not nature, it's an in-between. It's like a skin, it's only a skin. It's a very th thin skin. And I think in this paint, in this picture, you can feel this fragility and this, uh, just this kind of uh, uh, um, difficulty to, to delimit the forms of the cave. And uh, the most important thing for me is that it's not an architectonical space. So, um, this is the drawing I made when the work was first showed in my gallery in New York, Gladstone Gallery. So, uh, I just uh, used the entire space disponible and I used it um, uh, like I thought a caveman would use it to use the completely entire space. This is the first drawing who, after I tried to be truthful to it during the other exhibitions, this one is the sixth one. So, for example, this in 2006, it was the first time re-exhibited in Walker Art Center. It is, was the same. Then uh, 2000. 8 and 2009, 2008 first, it was exhibited in Carnegie, in Philadelphia, just the same space. I just have always to adapt it because there is an existing wall 
there is another existing wall, so I have to adapt it <coughs> in the space. Then 2009 was exhibited in the Highward Gallery in London, and again I had this, the same drawing and tried to figure out the same, um, the same uh, layout of the space. Then in Bilbao, uh, another uh, layout, of the, but of the same space. I will come back later. Uh, how I work is very simply in, in order to be truthful to it. And here, um, neon, um, this is the proposition in neon. And now, you know, for example, here is this mezzanine. Here is this mezzanine. And uh, because these two spaces are not very high, therefore, I could put it here and I switch the, the place like this. So therefore, uh, every time I try to, of course, with the space to arrange it, that it works out completely. So then uh, what we have to do, what you did, is to, you to make the structure with wood, the structure of this whole, uh, of the whole uh, caveman, man, and then, to cover it with these layers of, um, of cardboard covered with tape. It's a very thin construction. It's a very, um, very um, uh, uh, I think, easy to do in a way because you have just to make this first structure with the wood and then to cover it with these plates of cardboard. The idea is to go from the outside into inside, to switch the outside into inside. That's the, that's the important thing. The material I use since long time, not only for the cave, are the everyday materials like tape. I love to use it because it's an universal material all over the world, you can find tape. I love to use it because it's used for a lot of different things. It's used not only to do art, it's used to hold things together. I love it because it is made in urgency and also in uh, situations where uh, you absolutely need it. And therefore, there are the materials I love to work. So it's a political decision why I work with tape, with cardboard, with silver paper. Here, something I saw on the street with silver paper. I work with photocopies. I work with uh, materials every people use every day. Materials, they are non-intimidating. That's the important point for me. Then the logic. The logic of the artwork is my logic. You have not to share it, but it's my logic. I have for my work of art in general, but also for Caveman Man, I have to be very, very clear about the logic. This is a, a picture about, um, from the Chauvet cave, so about 36,000 years old. This is a skull of a bear somebody put on a stone. We don't know why, but there was for sure somebody who decided to do for a reason. And I'm, I think this is the logic. I, I see this as a logic. There is something very dis decided, and I'm interested in this. So I would love also to make clear, not to explain, but to make clear, things. Therefore, in a cave, for example, every, everything has his space and has his definition. Everything is put out. And it is like this because we discovered it like this, but now it's the logic. It's the completely logic. And um, uh, we have to deal with this logic. There was the, that was my meaning in uh, doing the the caveman man. And what you can also see here in this logic, in a cave, there are 
I call it galleries, and then there are throughways or tunnels to go in another galleries, and that's mostly mostly of the caves have in common this kind of uh, galleries spaces and the throughway to the gallery spaces. So I wanted to adapt them as well. And here I want to explain with this is in Hyward Gallery, but it's for the whole the same. It's just how I figured out the logic. They are five gallery spaces, five gallery spaces. This is, uh, this is a gallery space, gallery space, gallery space. This is the throughway, this is the throughway. And here we have in this, this is double cave. It's a kind of double cave, yes? So that's a logic, there are four, four, uh, five caves, but one of them is a double space, a double cave, yes? This one here, and that's another one, that's another one, that one. Oh. So this is how I worked out my logic. And in this logic, I have tools. These tools are elements. I want to explain a little bit about the elements. First of all, the mannequins. They're recurrent. That means they're in all of the caves, in all of the galleries. These are in all of them. They are linked together. They're holding together. It's important. They're all linked together. So my sources for to use the mannequin, they came from the street because they are in the street. The people use mannequins for to sell some clothes or also a link in art history here, Man Ray, 1937, this work, Mannequin. There is my sources, therefore there are coming my sources. Then another recurrent element are the four videos. In the four spaces there are four videos. The videos I made myself from the Lasco Cave 2. Why the videos are there? They are there because I wanted, like to have, to send the news, yes? The news from another cave. That was my idea. The news from another cave are in Cave Man Man. Like today, we have the news from Ukraine or from somebody else, somewhere else. So that was the idea to, to get the news of another cave inside. Then, uh, in, in these four caves, there are, I call it shelters. You see, that's a recurrent element, the shelters. They are with blocks of stones. There are four shelters with blocks of stones. But only in one of them is a bed. I mean, a kind of structure like this for what I thought, the caveman, where caveman man decided to put. And of course, the sources are coming from, uh, from spaces like this, where people here in south of Spain lives until today in caves. Here on the ground, you see another recurrent element. There are the stones. They are not the straight blocks, they are the stones. And these stones, they are surrounding the elements. You see for here, for example, in the cave, but also in the throughway, they are surrounding. And of course, there is a source I saw and I found beautiful. Somebody designed a space uh, with uh, stones. So this is a photo of the resources I had. Then there are these uh, garbage um, cans inside, of course. They want, I put them there in order to ask about uh, if somebody was there before, perhaps. Uh, perhaps uh, there was a visit before, whatever, or people used the space before. But also, I put it there because I'm interested in this kind of uh, dynamic who happen when the garbage is, 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 
is full, people still go and put stuff on it. And then, of course, the stuff goes, uh, goes down and spread out. So there are, um, there are uh, little uh, dynamics I'm interested in, and that's my sources, how I worked here, the garbage cans in these different galleries. And then um, another element uh, are these, uh, in all of the caves, uh, of, the, of the galleries, I mean, are this kind of trapped, it's like a trap, a trapped space with books and some, some maquettes of dynamic. And I saw them, I saw them in uh, manifestations. People used them for fake. And of course, by the way, with the materials I'm working with, with silver paper, with the tape, and also with this kind of wire. So I was interested to use this, and I call it the explosive uh, materials. And of course, these books, these books are the explosive. These books, the 10 books who are on the right side and on the left side of each cave. There are the explosive materials who, who could explode in this trapped space. There are the books, there are the 10 books I put. And of course, I put the books there uh, because I wanted to rethink the world. I wanted to re, re, reinterpret all the questions we already had about the right of man, about gender, about power, about economics. And then uh, there are specific elements in Caveman Man, specific elements in each of the sectors. Here, for example, in this um, throughway, in this throughway, you see the photocopies out of the books, out of a list of books I have, the photocopies I put on the wall and uh, of course, one of the references for this is how at 9-11 people tried uh, to, uh, uh, to find their beloved uh, in putting the pictures on the street in order to eventually get to know how, uh, uh, where they are. There are the wall texts, all the wall texts I had to put there, I put there. So it's, it's a list of uh, texts which I think we together, all together, we, we thought about, we, um, we, we discussed already. And, uh, um, and I wanted in this cave to put them on the wall um, like a, a kind of, yeah, perhaps a drawing or a, a, hand, a hand sign. So then here, for example, in, in, this, um, in this double cave, in this double cave, why double cave? Because there is only one shelter, only one bed, but there is two, uh, two explosive spaces in the beginning here and there. In this double uh, space, um, there is um, on, the, on the ceiling, the posters and books, they must be very high because we don't know, we don't know why they are so high, um, why they put on the, on the height on the wall. And of course, the elements comes from me, from this idea of an uh, adolescent person who decorate his or her space, which is also a kind of space, but it can be also somebody who create his own environment. There is Therefore, these elements on the, on the ceiling. And again, the books are there. They are there. You cannot read, reach them. They are too high. You cannot reach them. But they are here. Somebody thought about, somebody discussed it. And I wanted to, to give them the existence there. And again, of course, there is this book list, which is important to me. But it is not this, uh, on display. But it's important with the all political, social, economical, 
um, uh, inputs and thinking and, uh, and discussion. And then, again, in this double cave, there are um, the part of, uh, of, uh, of the, these uh, clocks on the wall. Uh, all are, have the same time, and they are linked with city names I choose uh, I choose from all over the world to make a kind of map, a kind of uh, mapping of the world. And of course, I try it uh, to avoid the, <laughs> the, the, the same cities who I see on perfumes, like New York, um, uh, uh, London, Paris, uh, Paris etc. Of course, again, a source, a source of, uh, for me, important. And, you know, uh, Dimitris, this is a preparatory drawing of material to me, this kind of sources in an internet cafe where these kind of clocks are on the wall. Then uh, the big space, the, the space with the big books. Um, there is, um, in this space, uh, there are 20 enlarged books. If I do enlarge a book, what happened? I enlarge the books because I found they are important. That's the gesture. I found they are important. But in enlarging them, I put away the content. So they are empty now. There is no more content. And there I'm interested in this, in this enlarging, making it important, and also putting away the content. Uh, and of course, that's happened also if somebody enlarged another element, not a book, here a big key. It's the same. I am interested in, in this kind of make it big, important, and is it useless in a way because you cannot open the gate behind. But it's about the idea of it. And again, the 20, there are 20 enlarged books. I have the list with me. They are chosen for, for the question, can we live together? equality and difference, etc. Their books were important. It's not about to read it, but to, to know that somebody thought about and produced them, and now they are in this cave. Then the other space, it's about the uh, space about, I call it human at work, humans at work with all the photos, the little, or the prints out, out of people who are working. Every picture is there is always people working. They have in a working context uh, on the wall. So that was uh, how I choose it. And that's just, uh, again, uh, it's a kind of uh, um, one sources of, um, of people at work. Uh, because I wanted in the cave have this memory of people at work. People, they do something, they work something. Therefore, here, this. Um, uh, this source. And finally, the space one man equal one man, who, of course, to me, uh, is related to the uh, human rights um, activities where people uh, put in America in the 60s, uh, one man, one vote, or um, um, uh, I am a man. And so in this case, uh, there is this writing on the wall, who also, to me, could be, again, like uh, a trace or kind of, yeah, a trace somebody put, by the way, also in a cave, but not in a Lascaux cave or sh sh uh, in another cave. Or then, of course, the writing or the drawing in Lascaux, like here. So that's um, some uh, of the of the thoughts, of the clarifications, if ever um, it could be, I wanted to share with you. Thank you. Um, we'll uh, proceed with some questions. Uh, to I'll, I'll put the first question. <laughs> uh, getting back to that experience, uh, 
uh, uh, uh, in my, with watching people coming out of the room, out of the cave, and the power of art to uh, impact people so profoundly, um, I was wondering, what is it about Caveman Man? What is it about large-scale installations? What is it about great art that makes it have that effect? I mean, I had the possibility to fill the whole gallery space at Gladstone at this time. And of course, it's about always, I think, to put everything, <laughs> everything you, you could, you can do. And of course, uh, you need some space to do it. It's about uh, also the idea to have a physical a physical, it's very, it's, I think, important to have a physical, to create a physical space. It's a kind of physicality, means you have to go through. For example, here, also very important Immersion. is... Immersion. Immersion. Yes, yeah. you, can, you have to go inside and to go outside the same space, uh, the same door, for example. So it's not a through-walk space. Uh, for example, that you can do. So there are elements you can, um, um, uh, I think when you do a large artwork, you can improve, you can try to improve. And also, I uh, personally, Dimitris, I love to work and I love to, yeah, to, to, lo to work a lot. And um, it is, um, of course, the idea is always to do, to touch um, uh, the, the whom who is in this cave or who goes there to touch it in a way that he or she is transformed. That could be the dream uh, who I could have. And, and of course, in order that this dream can happen, I have to do and I have to give everything. And therefore, I have to do this effort and to make a large work. Okay. Um, one more question that is related. Um, you're a frequent practitioner of large-scale installations, frequent creator of them. And the, my thoughts, well, first of all, seeing exhibitions that include large-scale installations, I was always struck by the fact that they would impact me and other viewers uh, in a very strong way. Uh, the only explanation I, I have for that um, is that um, artists are, when, when working on large-scale installations, are liberated from the small confines of their studio and are free to express their creativity in the most unbridled way they can. <laughs> Would you share that sentiment as a practitioner of uh, large-scale art? Or how, how does it work for you? Uh, yeah, for, first of all, I love other art who uh, implicates me um, physically. I love it uh, because it's a challenge and it's um, an offer also. For example, uh, Mar um, uh, Kurt Schwitters with the Mertzbau, which is of course to me a very important artwork uh, because this person, he, Kurt Schwitters, tried, yes, he tried to completely uh, construct or surrounding him, his own world, his world. And of course, this is something impresses me. There are other artists who, uh, for example, there is also um, uh, uh, a Swiss artist, a colleague, his, his name is Christoph Büchel. Huh. He made a work in, um, in Palais de Tokyo called Dump. And I must say, uh, when I went, to the work in Palais de Tokyo in Paris. So uh, it, it, it's really a work I, I remember forever. It's so, uh, because it's, uh, it's a challenge, a physical challenge. Uh, and I am interested in it. So first of all, I love it myself to be confronted to this. And then of course, as artist, after when I have the occasion to do it, I am happy because I think I need to I can give everything inside. I can try to uh, to use the space in a way which is um, not only 
to exhibit a piece of art, you know, but make the whole, uh, the, to question the whole. I mean, the, my whole work, my, the whole, the sense of my entire work. And therefore, I love to do this, this large uh, artworks which englobes you and challenge me, who do it, but also the viewer, probably. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, we'll open the floor now to any questions. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I couldn't help but notice there was a lot of Nietzsche books in your list. And I was just wondering if uh, there is one philosopher that uh, has influenced you on the way or has formed the way you have been thinking as an artist, and if that's him or somebody else and also the way you, your ethics or or who, who how who do you feel more related in terms of as a philosopher and as an artist okay um i i there is no one per philosopher because i understand uh philosophy as a as a galaxy of thinkers, of thinkers, and um, I am happy to, if I can, reach out one or two or several, perhaps, of them and to construct with this uh, my own galaxy. Of course, they are philosophers I really, uh, for me, are very important, like uh, Spinoza, for example, but more recently, I discovered, for example, Simone Weil, the French philosopher, which is um, uh, as an artist, for me as an artist, so radical and so singular that I must say it's like an artwork she did. And of course I am interested, why I'm interested in philosophy? I'm interested because it's about a thinking which has a form always. For example, Spinoza, it's very, very I think, I don't say I understand Spinoza, but just I say, I see his effort to be very, very logic in his use of terms he use. And therefore, I'm interested in philosophy. I think there is a friendship between art and philosophy. And by the way, with my friend, Markus Steinweg, we made a map, friendship between art and philosophy. I think it's the same battle to construct our own you know, to construct uh, a light or to, yeah, to, to, to be a light in a way. Sometimes the light is stronger, sometimes it's less strong, but because it's perhaps less strong, because it's farther away, or perhaps it's less strong because it's, it's less, less uh, strong because it's uh, less important, I don't know. But it's about this we share with, uh, with philosophers, me as artist. I want to do a work which, which, which shines, which uh, makes a light, yeah, which makes a light first to myself. And therefore, I feel close to philosophers. And I mean close, yeah, I love to read philosophy. And really, I love, not because I have the pretension to understand, but uh, more uh, to uh, understand. What I understand is the effort of the philosophers to make clear things to me. And um, in the cave, there are several of the books which I think uh, wants to show this, this effort to make things clear, to clarify things. Hi. Uh, here. I'm a bit hidden, but it's okay. I want to make a question regarding... Um, you said you want to make something that you need to shine, let's say, like something more that you experience for yourself also, but also for the people that are going to watch it and go through this dream or whatever this is, each time, I mean. And I was just wondering if... Like, why did you start making these art pieces? Apart from the, from, the, from the part that you want to experience it, 
didn't you want to be around to see what the impact was exactly? Are you sure about the impact each time? Or do you wonder and in some ways, like, you question yourself and how do you get the answer? I mean, do you feel that question? And if you feel it, how do you look for the answer? Yeah, thank you for your question. If, if I may uh, explain that, first of all, you know, I had a long time to understand that uh, art is something who I feel implicated myself. And um, there are artworks I was in contact. I remember very good, for example, an exhibition of uh, Joseph Beuys or Andy Warhol at Kunsthaus Zürich when I made my studies. And they were, I feel implicated that the first time I felt implicated in something who I didn't, couldn't understand, but I think, oh, they want to speak to me. And uh, I felt as a human being and as a visitor, I feel, oh, there is something I can be involved, I can think about. So there was a very positive, for me, an encounter with art. And later, when I started uh, to put my work into the art world, in a way, uh, I, of course, I was always thinking I would love to do a work where people feel implicated. But it's not the first, uh, the first goal. The first goal is to give everything I can, I already told it, and then there is a little chance, I thought, that somebody is implicated. Now, you know, uh, Dimitris, before he said very nice things about people who comes out of the cave. But even when it's very nice to hear it, to me, it's, um, it's nice, but it's not about it. I must, I must myself think, oh, was I clear inside? Was I really clear what I did? I, I mean, and did I everything what I could? Didn't I say, I'm too tired my, uh, now, I, I cannot resolve, I cannot high, go higher, etc. There is no excuse. So if I did everything what I can, with my limited forces, then I think there is a little chance that somebody can implicate it. And th that's always the same, I think, more or less all artists, I'm sure, more or less, I think, that's about it, you know. And then uh, the, la the last thing I want to say is that we artists, or I mean, me as artist, I, I think it's beautiful, uh, it's a beautiful. Uh, it's beautiful to do art, uh, because why? Because the question is always uh, why and how. And uh, you know, every moment I start, uh, or makes it still sense or whatever. And there are the, f the 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 crucial questions. And I'm not saying I give with every work of art an, a good response or a response even, but that's the try to start again and again of new, and that's that's why I love uh, to do art. <clears throat> good up, good Abend. Um, I wanted to ask you, Picasso, when he left uh, Lascaux's cave, said something like, we've invented nothing. What would you say to him in light of your exhibition? Uh, sorry, who, who said we invented P nothing? Picasso said, we've invented nothing when he left uh, the caves of Lascaux. And I wonder what you might say to him if he was here at this exhibition. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, he's not here. <laughs> but look. <laughs> who, who, who said that? Picasso. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, look, um, I, I cannot comment what an artist colleague, even so huge like he says. But therefore, therefore, if I can respond to you, look, therefore, I'm so touched by the woman who said they were here. Because why? Because she... You know, it's like a confirmation of something, but um, of confirmation of her hope to me, of her a hope she had, not, not of a, a specific hope. And there, therefore, I wanted to, I did show it to you. Uh, they were here. 
you know. Uh, we are, or she could say, we are not alone. Or, you know, it's not, Picasso had a problem with his ego. I think the question is the ego question. But I have not the ego problem. I have a problem with, no, we are not alone, or there was something else. For example, I'm interested, there are still caves somewhere, perhaps with even older, who knows? We don't know, and they are here, this presence, you know. And um, for like the cave Chauvet, which is only since 28 years discovered now, yes? So there are some, st and there I'm interested in this. In this presence, we don't know, but they are here. And therefore I'm touched by, by this phrase, they were here. Um, hi. Um, I was interested in your um, in the building building process. I'm here. Um, how do you look for your team? Do you have some sort of sous chefs, like people who are always coming with you and building building your your sculptures, or do you always source the people from the region? Um, because even giving everything, I believe you cannot build it only by your own, so you've got to have somebody to help you. And I, I, I was interested how you manage with this also, because I, I'm a really big fan of the Robert Walser statue, and I'm, I was also interested in about your working process, building all these sculptures. Yeah, as artists, we are not alone. We need help. I mean, I needed the help of the crew, the fantastic neon crew here who, who did this. Of course, the preparation, the restoration, and then the layout, of course. I mean, we need help. I need help as artist always. I work with assistants. I work with people who helps me to do the work, of course. I, my responsibility is to look that they are paid for their work, uh, of course, not to use them, not to manipulate them. But then, of course, I am the artist. I have to take the responsibility about it. And therefore, uh, every, every decision has to be taken by the artist. But it's not the decision about is this book on the, on the top of the other, for example, and the big books, is this book there and there? It's not this decision. But of course, the decision there, all 20 books are there, or all uh, of the mannequins are in the space, et cetera, et cetera. And therefore, I'm responsible, and I have to take this, this responsibility as artist. So uh, assistance helps, yes, and uh, there are no how you call it, sous chefs, uh, they are not an inspiration also. For me, I don't ask them to inspire my, myself. I hope I have a lot of inspiration myself. But I need help. I cannot do it alone. But still something important is even in, in a, for example, it's a, when I can uh, say you do this, in a general question is, I want to always have the idea that I can do it myself, you know? Even, of course, perhaps here I, I had uh, four months to do it, yes? But um, I, I try, also in the Robert Walser sculpture, not to use some uh, procedures or some methods which exclude, uh, for example, one human force, yes? All in my work, I try to do, to do this. This is something I try to do, but I need help. Therefore, I ask help for help. Okay, just one more thing, but you're always present. Like in these four months, you were present, or you are always present in the time of building up. Is it right? No, or? no. For example, here, I was not present at all. Here, I was not present at all, because, of course, here is a reinstallation of the already existing work. I made it five times before, the, 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 what I show you, the, the pictures before. But here, it was my assistant, Mark, who came and did it. And, of course, I was very close with him, linked every, every moment, more or less. And with the new technological uh, stuff, we could communicate, and uh, he, made, uh, he made it... I'm very, I, I came the first time today, and um, I, I'm very happy to see it like it is, and there is nothing to change. I, I, t I can add um, something to that. 
Uh, I've seen the piece installed three times, and I can't see a single difference. So every time it's, it's done impeccably. Hello. Um, since you include in this installation, this fantastic installation, I was really inspired by your work. Uh, since you include um, elements from our civilization, uh, including books and uh, rubbish and uh, all this material, everyday material you use, uh, does this installation have something to do with a kind of arc, Noah's arc, something that will remain if after a destruction? I mean, the sense of arc, you know what I mean. Um, I, I think no, because uh, I think no, um, uh, because it's uh, not about to save something. It's about to rediscover it. It's about to rethink them, really. Uh, it's about to, to re-accept their existence. Um, it's about, yeah, it's just at the moment, again. Uh, it's not for a project. That's perhaps an Arche Noah was a project. It's a project. There is no project. It's just a, a kind of state. You know, when I said before, I started with 9-11, you know, so I think that was my, the, the out, the, the, this shock, these questions, this doubt about what to do or whatever. So I wanted to, I wanted to make a lie out of this situation at this point. And then, uh, of course, again, you have to think, makes it sense, makes it sense to continue, makes it sense to, to believe in all the great books, for example, here, who are not reachable, is it makes it sense or not? So I wanted more, uh, give the space to this question again. That was my idea. Hello, congratulations about your work and thank you for being here and doing this presentation to us. My question is about the initial idea and the artwork itself. This artwork already counts 20 years. How loyal are you to the initial idea of your artwork in 2002 until now? Do you use the same materials, tin cans, the fake TNTs, the large books, the tapes and the stones and the projections inside? Or do you find uh, opportunities in each country or in each museum that is presented to change it a little bit and make it and, and say something different than the things that you are al already saying? How, how loyal are you to the initial idea and how does, th how does that affects the artwork in itself. Okay, uh, I mean here, I, I cannot say I'm loyal. I try to be very truthful and loyal to my work, of course, it's the same. But if I can a little bit explore your question, of course it's an interesting question because we are asked all the time as artists, okay, Thomas, it's always the same, huh, for example. Not this work, not this work, but other works, uh, new works, you know, it's always the same, the same material, the same stuff, uh, whatever. Okay, that's a question. And uh, that's a question of, and you are true, that's a question also of loyalty, for example, for material. Therefore, I wanted to speak a little bit about the material, yes? Because, of course, uh, these materials, um, after 20 years to use. Not, I'm not speaking about this work, but to use this kind of materials. People can interrogate it, makes it sense, or also saying, yes, it's always the same, or that's the, the artist who works with tape, or whatever. You know, I know this, I know this. And this is the tricky thing. So between truthfulness to something, 
and between the opportunity or the chance or whatever uh, to change and to use something else. For the moment, sir, I am for truthfulness to my materiality, and I pay the price also for it, because uh, <laughs> you have always the price to pay as an artist if you, if you change the materiality or so, or if you are truthful. I know, I have to pay the price for it. But I'm not saying I'm working always with the same material. But for example, therefore I, I try to clarify it. The reason for a material must be a political reason. And for me is the universality, the non-intimidating and the not blue value of this material. Therefore, I want to be truthful and loyal to this political decision. Uh, Thomas, uh, I think we'll call it a night. Uh, and thank you very much for coming again. Thank you. Thank you.